Um, we're going to forego the five minute break and proceed with um, Ugo's talk at this point. Um, Ugo is a native of Italy. You can go ahead and come on up, Ugo. And he's a senior researcher at the Sorensen Foundation. He has his doctorate in molecular biology and studies genetics at the molecular level, both for anthropological um, investigations of human migration, in addition to, more recently, um, genealogical and family history work uh, as traced through molecular biology. Hey, very well. It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, definitely not the type of conferences I usually speak to. And so I, I truly hope that uh, in the next 20 minutes I've been given to share a um, few thoughts about um, things I've been involved with and things I've been uh, uh, contemplating, and as well as uh, some of the latest research finding in the field of DNA, that uh, there is something that will make a good tie into uh, the purpose of this conference. Um, just as a way to begin, in, you know, I am a senior researcher for a nonprofit organization called Sorenson Molecular Genealogy Foundation, and. Uh, I think that uh, it's very appropriate mentioning about this group um, since the founder, uh, James Levoy Sorenson, who passed away in 2008, uh, founded this group uh, back in 1999 with uh, a vision that uh, through better understanding of uh, um, genetics and uh, human genetics in particular in our DNA, that we could uh, uh, introduce a better understanding in population, in people, in their minds, how closely related we are to each other, and uh, change and uh, uh, kind of switch the paradigm, paradigm that uh, uh, tend to uh, s look at each other as different, as uh, weird, uh, you know, that guy has an accent, so it must not be very normal or trustworthy, you know, and. Uh, and uh, his goal was, you know, let's create a place where we can gather genetic and genealogical information from as many populations worldwide and demonstrate the closeness um, of relationship of all the individuals so that we can uh, perhaps motivate them to treat e um, each other differently. He was very much involved with interfaith groups, uh, Jews, Arabs, Christians, and uh, knowing that uh, there are not much, uh, there is not much different from uh, a physical, uh, morph uh, even morphological, but especially genetic point of view, should, uh, uh, in his mind, uh, um, be at the base of some of the uh, reasoning and thinking and uh, war piece. You know, if you want to talk about, you know, like a, you know, Miss America type of message, you know, war seeking war peace was really his, uh, uh, his goal. He was a true transhumanist uh, in many ways. Um, he, he was seeking out to improve human life through uh, development of medical devices, but he figured out that at the base of much of the suffering was also the uh, fact that people did not understand each other and were not willing to cooperate and understand each other. So uh, just uh, to start uh, a little bit, you know, in a, in a nutshell, uh, how does uh, genetics, how uh, has DNA uh, information that has come forth in the last 20 years has revolutionized or changed some of the uh, cultural traditions and uh, religious traditions and the view of men uh, with regard you know, to religions or other, other fields. So we kind of have to go back a little bit to where does life come from. And so in uh, uh, yes, it is probably not a good transhumanist <laughs> perspective, you know, but uh, if we are not careful, you know, if there is no uh, an active effort to better ourselves, the natural man would probably really tend to go this direction through evolution, actually de-evolution, and um, but the point is that uh, where does life begin? Where does man come from? And uh, are there different races? Uh, and are we that much different from each other? And uh, one of the things I often ask pretty much everywhere I go is how do I reconcile the fact that uh, I am a religious individual and I consider myself uh, uh, 
you know, a believer and uh, a scientist, you know, and, uh, you know, kind of always had that thing about my life, you know, I was a Mormon in, uh, in Italy, Catholic country, I was uh, an Italian in the United States, and I'm a scientist among Mormons, so I never fit in any of the groups I've been in, <laughs> so I guess, you know, I, I kind of get used to it, but the fact is that, uh, you know, one of the questions, and especially as I work with colleagues and scientists around the world, you know, they, how can you reconcile the biblical text of the creation with what science is uh, uh, showing. And, uh, you know, I don't know, but when you wear your scientist glasses, you tend to, to read things differently. Things that you have been reading for years in the scriptures now come out a little bit different, three-dimensional, as you want to, to um, think about it. And so, you know, here there is a, a text from uh, the... Um, Book of Abraham, which is one of the books considered scripture, sacred scripture, equal to the Bible um, um, among Mormons. And uh, in my mind, uh, uh, it, it fit very well with uh, a concept of uh, evolution and creation at the same time where the, God, the gods prepared um, the elements or an environment in which uh, life could come forth. So it was not the gods that create life, but they created the environment uh, for life to, uh, to, be, to, to come forth. And, um, you know, where does life, uh, you know, I mean, here there is another little uh, comic, but, you know, in, in a nutshell, this is, this is just funny, but in a nutshell, uh, all life is taught to, to begin uh, in... Uh, primordial um, broth uh, where uh, in, uh, in it the first living organism in very simple prokaryotes, uh, cells that uh, have very basic elements, much smaller than the eukaryotic cells, which uh, are the cells that our bodies are, for, for example, made of. Uh, originally it was uh, um, this very simple organism, just a little bit of genetic material, very little um, of uh, anything else to it, and then uh, eventually through, that was about three and a half billion years ago, and then eventually these uh, uh, organism tend to adapt, their genetic material tend to change, those that had a more advantageous mutation tend to survive, those that had disadvantageous mutation would be eliminated into the future generations and disappear. And that's uh, what we call also in genetics, genetic drift, which is also happening very much today. And uh, eventually the organism got more and more complex. Uh, eukaryotic cells uh, start appearing, multicellular organisms. Eventually, uh, here we go forth, you know, you have two organisms talking to each other and says, go forward, my sister, and explore this vast universe, and should our path ever cross again, all the stories we'll tell. Goodbye, sister, parting in such sweet sorrow. And here he goes on their journey to evolution, you know, the same common ancestor that we had three and a half mil billion years ago. And on one path, you start having uh, one set of evolution, and on the other path, you have a different one, and to the apes, and then you got a woman, and here he is what the sister's doing to the, each other today, right? But, you know, I mean, this is a funny take on it, but that's basically in a nutshell what we think it happened in the theory of evolution, theory that is based on the fact that today you still have in the nature this very simple organism, these uh, prokaryotic cells are still around, and the genetic material shows that we are very much similar um, to any other organism, plants or animal on the earth. So... We, we believe, as a scientist, that uh, about six million years ago, uh, there was a common ancestor to apes and humans. And, uh, and that, of course, is very much uh, uh, in, in contrast, if you will, to the literal and more orthodox reading of the creation that you would find in the book of Genesis. And so how do you reconcile the fact that there could be hominid, people that, uh, or, or 
beings that looks like uh, humans being around and walking around for millions of years when the Bible says that uh, Adam was created 6,000 years ago. And, uh, and so you probably notice things, I'm just gonna go through very quick since I don't have that, that much time, but you know, the, the word creation as used in the book uh, of Genesis is, uh, has, was uh, a choice of wording from the English translator is not what you would find in the Hebrew translation of the Old Testament, which uh, does not use a word that imply uh, creation ex nihilo from nothing, but um, more of uh, an organization of existing material. Um, the, uh, Joseph Smith, in his translation of the Bible, in the book of Luke, uh, changed uh, uh, a verse in which uh, man was not created but was formed by God which I think has uh, a very significant difference in, uh, in understanding. And, uh, and so, you know, man was uh, organized, I guess, and um, using natural elements, as uh, the Bible says, it was created from the dust of the earth. There was uh, uh, male and female eventually, and uh, that because uh, in, uh, uh, we belong to a, a species which uh, uh, reproduce sexually, and uh, we need to have uh, something that goes on, it's called meiosis, in which uh, each uh, parent contributes half of the genetic material to the offspring, and therefore we need, by necessity, to have a male or female to create a new posterity, new generation. And, um, and that's something interesting that uh, is, w way, is very much emphasized in Mormon theology, but is also found across many other cultures is that eventually to this man, God put in a breath of life. And so in my mind, as I read these things, I see that there was two creation or two parts in the creation. One was the physical forming of the body of Adam and, uh, and whoever was with him. And then there was a, a spiritual creation in which eventually something from God, a breath of life was put into this creature into this, uh, this uh, human-like form. And this goes very much hand-in-hand uh, hand with uh, ancient uh, Egyptian tradition in which uh, um, they have uh, uh, anciently come out with uh, a recipe of what constitutes a man. You know, and uh, for those of you that are familiar with, uh, with uh, um, the, temp the Mormon temple um, endowment, you know, that there is a question that Elohim asked to Jehovah and is, is man found on the earth? And it's like, no, man is not found on the earth. And if we can understand what do they mean with the word man, you know, maybe we can understand better the concept of how man came to be. And so, you know, using the Egyptian, Egyptian tradition, there are nine components that are necessary to make a man the way that we understand it today. And, uh, and one of that is to have a physical body, to have a brain, to have a heart, uh, to have a shadow, to have intelligence, to have a spirit, and so on and so forth. And so would uh, you still, would you call somebody that has all these components, like eight out of nine, for example, uh, everything but the spirit, would you call that a man? Or would that be something similar to, but not quite a man? And so what, what uh, did Elohim, what did God intend when his man found on the earth? It was something that had all eight of the components but missing the one thing, the breath of life being there and how the creation of the physical parts came to be versus the spiritual part came to be. And so uh, my, my interpretation would be that man was a, a creation of God just like most of the animals but creation not has been created, but that we receive the same uh, um, the material, the dust of the earth, as uh, horses or dogs or cats or fishes, and then different than all the other creations, we, become we became children of God in the moment he decided to put his, the spirit of man inside uh, those physical bodies that had a different evolutionary path. So man, uh, created as we observe them today, we are very much uh, different from each other, and, and that has led through uh, the century 
uh, trying to create a catalog of humans and uh, dividing them by races, which uh, are based on, uh, on morphology. And uh, there are probably as many, uh, there have been as many classification as anthropologists uh, out there. So there is much, a, a lot of uh, um, discordance in, in, in the way that, that they try to do that. But when you look to, from a genetic point of view, you know, we are very, very similar genetic, genetically. As I say, you know, we share probably common ancestor with apes six, uh, million, six million years ago. We share 98% of our DNA with, uh, with apes, with chimps. And uh, out of the one point, you know, but it's about 98.2% uh, of our genome, out of the 1.8 differences that we have with chimps, 1.7% are species specific differences. So that's what make us human versus apes. So that out of all the DNA we have, which is 3.2 billion pieces uh, of information or genetic information, what makes us human and what makes um, the chimps chimps is about 1.8%. So not that much difference. So that leaves us with a 0.1 uh, genetic variation that is observed among humans today. That is if you take a, a person from Africa and a person from Sweden or a person from a, a Native American, you only observe a 0.1% variation. Out of that variation, there is about a, a zero, uh, about 10% of that, so 0.01% is continental variation, meaning that uh, there are that is uh, how much an African is really different from a European or, or from an Asian or from a Native American. So it's extremely small amount that we are different. However, if you still consider 0.1% genetic difference out of 3.2 billion pieces of DNA, you're talking about 3 million possible polymorphism, which is still considerable, but we're not talking about large chunks of DNA or genes that are different from human to human but we're talking most often about single differences that would change the coding of a particular protein and uh, create then, uh, you know, the, the phenotypes of being uh, black versus being white or being uh, uh, straight hair versus having curly hair or so on. So very, very little differences. Now into the genealogy, if you look at the numbers, you know, how many ancestors each human individual have today uh, and you go back in time, you see that they grow exponentially. It's a simple mathematical rule that every generation going back, um, you just have to multiply by two. And so if I go back 20 generations, I would have one million ancestors and then everybody in this, on this planet would have the same amount of ancestors. And if I go back uh, 30 generations, I would have uh, uh, one billion ancestors. And so that's seven 750 years ago, considering 25 generations uh, 25 years per generation, then that you see immediately there is a tremendous discrepancy between how many ancestors I can possibly have versus how many uh, individuals lived on the earth. Not only that, you know, 30 um, generations ago, about 750 years ago, it's estimated that 400 million people were on the earth. So it's a much smaller number than even my own ancestors. So think about 7 billion people living today times 1 billion ancestors. That's the number of potential ancestors and there were only 400 million people that were the ancestors of all these people 750 years ago. So we are all uh, part of the same genetic mix. In fact, not only that, but out of these 400 million uh, people that lived back then, probably less than 20% of them are responsible for all the people that are alive today. I mean, you have to grow to adulthood, so survive diseases, survive all the problems that there were uh, when the modern medicine was not available, uh, find a mate, you know, have children and so on. And then the other thing is that, you know, they did a study in Iceland where they saw using genealogical data that 80% of the population today is descendants of 20% of the population 300 years ago. So there is this tremendous things of genetic drift in which few people become the ancestors of everybody. So we are closely related than, than what we think we are. Uh, the mathematical study of genealogy indicates that everyone in the world is descended from Nefertiti and Confucius, and everyone of European ancestry is descended from Mohammed and Charlemagne. And I did put a picture of Mohammed there. I didn't want to offend anybody here. You know, it's, you know uh, our days you never know if you have to be politically correct. But the point is, well, how do you feel that uh, the Prophet Mohammed is part of your genealogy? How do you feel about people that believe in him as a prophet? You know. 
uh, you know, time is a killer, so I have, I'm really rushing through it, but um, you know, if you look at, at what genetic markers are used in today for genealogical purposes, the two, there are, there are basically three markers you can use. Two are straightforward, it's the Y chromosome inherited along, exclusively along the paternal line, uh, father to son, only males carry is what makes uh, an individual a male versus a female, the presence of the Y chromosome. So um, it's a great tool in, uh, in genetic and population studies because it does not recombine with other genes and with other chromosomes and uh, it uh, uh, comes from a straight paternal line, so we know exactly which line to follow. Similarly, we have another marker called the mitochondrial DNA, which comes through the maternal line. In this case, both men and females have that, but only women can pass it on to the next generation. That also does not recombine with other DNA. That means it stays the same almost every generation. And then we know it comes from the mother. And then all these other ancestors contributed different pieces of DNA that went on the autosomes, the 22 chromosomes, that uh, um, are part of the nuclear DNA besides uh, the sex chromosomes. This is an ancestral pen painting of my own DNA based on uh, um, chromosome, uh, chromosomal analysis. 500,000 pieces of DNA have been analyzed and compared with other population. As uh, you can see, on every chromosome, I, am, uh, I have a result of 100% uh, European, which is not a surprise to me because as far as I can go back with my genealogy, uh, all my ancestors were from northern Italy with few exceptions from southern Italy, but nothing else there, no surprises. Yet when I look at the Y chromosome, my, the one that I received from my father, um, I belong to a, a group called Aplogroup C, which is only found in Asia. So there is a discrepancy right here because, you know, I, I knew I was European from the genealogical record, uh, from uh, morphologically the way I look, from my language, from my tradition. I know I'm also European from my chromosomal painting that uh, I receive uh, um, from this lab. And yet when I look at one single marker, which is my paternal line, which is the, in Western culture the most important line because it's the one that gives you the surname, is the one you identify yourself by, that is Asian. So I am Asian, or at least to some degree. And, and that was a, a huge surprise because I was wondering you know, how in the world I got this uh, Y chromosome from Asia in Italy, in my family, in my DNA. Here's a tree that shows all the different um, Y chromosome groups around the world. Each one has a different geographic distribution. Based on that, you can determine the migration of people. And about 200,000 years ago, um, People were all in Africa, and then there was a migration out of Africa, the, the so-called out of Africa theory, and then the population of all the continent. And as you can see, C is found mostly in, in Asia and none in, none in Europe. He has a frequency of about 0.05% in, uh, in Europe, so it's extremely rare there. And as I was talking with a uh, um, professor at Stanford University uh, that also tested my Y chromosome to confirm there was a C, and there was no lab error, he, uh, postulate that perhaps uh, I am the residual of an ancient barbaric uh, invasion in northern Italy, probably by Attila the Han around the 5th century AD, in which they came all the way, the Huns, all the way uh, from Asia, it is the blue line, all the way to northern Italy, which is where my paternal family, my paternal line is from. And of course, I have no genealogical record that goes back to 500 AD but my genetic record shows that connection to Asia. So I'm European, and yet I'm also Asian, you know, and so how does that expand my understanding of the human race and my connection? You can do the same thing with mitochondrial DNA. I don't have the time to explain all that, but here is a tree that has myself on it, and uh, this is by genealogy, my mother, my, my maternal grandmother, my father, my paternal grandfather, my maternal, my paternal grandmother, and uh, we, we are here on the tree. So here is me with my mother and my maternal grandmother because uh, as a mitochondrial DNA tree, so everyone has the same mitochondrial DNA. And then here is my grandfather on my paternal line, and, and here is my dad and his mother. And we are all part of different groups, and uh, we can calculate how distantly we are uh, in time, you know, um, based on, on the mutation rate. But what, I'm inter what is interesting here is that uh, although genealogically this is my family, from a straight mitochondrial DNA point of view, I am closely related to six strangers 
who I found DNA in a public database, then I head to my own grandparents, my paternal grandparents. And so what I'm saying here is that DNA is helping you also to expand the concept of family beyond the genealogy, beyond tradition, and appreciate that there are people out there that share things with you closely than your own family in the traditional point of view. Okay, um, if I have one, 30 more seconds, maybe we don't have the question, just to tell a little bit about uh, some of the recent stuff. Uh, in 2002, the complete uh, human genome was sequenced, and um, since then, uh, we are uh, having a better understanding of what, uh, um, of, of, of human history. One of the things that we thought uh, in the past, anthropologically, archeologically, was that Neanderthals were our ancestors, then studies on mitochondrial DNA had revealed that there was different DNA, so the Neanderthals were indeed we share a common ancestor with them, but we were two different species. And then eventually, with the genomic era and the complete sequencing of DNA, both of the inch of the remains of Neanderthals, so we have a complete genome, 3.2 billion pieces of information for the Neanderthals now, as well as we have for humans. And these are the places where the Neanderthals lived, so Middle East, no ancient Near East, uh, Europe and uh, the, the Black Sea area, although we found uh, re uh, recently they found some all the way to Siberia, so that's even uh, more there. But they, they took five complete genomes of modern humans, Asia, uh, Papua Guinea, two from Africa, and a French guy. These are not the, represent these are not the people that they did the DNA, but just to represent the areas. And, uh, you know, this is the out of Africa, so we had, you know, everybody moving to the near uh, ancient east, uh, and then uh, we had uh, European colonization, Asian, and then eventually uh, down into um, Australasia. And uh, what happened is that uh, when they compared the complete genome of a Neanderthal with modern Homo sapiens, they found uh, between one to four percent of their DNA that was in common, which was a, an unexpected discovery before uh, beforehand. We thought we were completely unrelated to them, and so what this indicates that probably, and, and there, there is archaeological evidence that modern humans like us, Homo sapiens, we, we are Homo sapiens sapiens, and Neanderthal is Homo sapiens neanderthalensis, which is a different subset of of the Homo sapiens group. The thought were two different species, Homo sapiens kill all the Neanderthals, now in breeding, get rid of that. However, based on the genetic evidence, we now know that Europeans and Asians share one to, to four percent of DNA with Neanderthals, which uh, indicates that probably the, the ancient Near East was a hot spot for inbreeding between uh, the two species, and um, to Europe and find more Neanderthals, uh, eventually they get rid of them. And, uh, but this, this is a tremendous discovery because it changes a little bit the phylogeny. Here is our common ancestor uh, back uh, six billion years ago. And, uh, and here you have uh, the Neanderthals and uh, about one to four percent of their DNA in us. So what does it make of us? You know, it goes, goes back to the fact, you know, that perhaps it's not just, it's not very important how we came to be as physical beings but how we are as spiritual beings, you know, that so if I have Neanderthal DNA, if I am uh, the descendants of a eukaryotic cell that lives six bill, uh, three and a half billion years ago, that does not matter as much as who I am as, a, as an individual in this society and my relationship to God. You know, and I love this, the fact that Michelangelo, when painting the Sistine Chapel, he decided to put a belly button on Adam you know, and, uh, you know, why do we have belly buttons, you know, and uh, that should explain a little bit that probably Michelangelo was inspired in knowing that probably there was some physical parents and uh, many, many generations before that, and then God just say, you are going to be the man with uh, my spirit and start a new generation. Thank you.